Good evening, everyone. Great to see you back here for the second lecture in the New Testament survey. As we begin tonight, uh, I'm going to share with you from John chapter 1, and I'll read a few verses from uh, the first chapter of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness is not understood it. There's also a footnote right here in the NIV. There's another possible translation, the darkness has, has not overcome it, which is the translation that I personally actually prefer. So it's either understood it, the darkness didn't understand it, or the darkness didn't overcome it. Uh, either obviously would be true. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. And then it goes on to talk about John the baptizer or or John the Baptist. And then in verse 10 or in verse 9, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And then actually in verse 14, the very reason why we are here, in fact, the reasons we find from the first verse uh, from the beginning, and this is where John starts his gospel, in the beginning was the word. And then in verse 14, um, this word who was with God and who is God himself broke into our human reality. And this is what it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's the reason why we even can be here tonight. And that's the reason why we believe that as Christians we have the true faith. We, we believe in the Word of God. Jesus is the, the living Word of God. And I'm holding in my hand the written Word, which is a reflection or a testimony and a description of the true, the living Word of God. And if we believe what John is saying, which I do believe, then in the beginning was this Word, and this Word was with God, and this Word came into our very being, into our human existence. He broke into the world that He Himself created. Creator became creation in order to save us. And the beauty of that is that Jesus came to, to identify with us in who we are, uh, in our sinfulness, and ultimately dying on the cross for our sins but walking this earth, being born as a human being, growing up with parents like any normal human being, and then launched into his ministry with the ultimate purpose within a three, four year period after starting his public ministry of dying on the cross. And, and by, that, by doing that, taking the sins of the world, taking my sins upon himself. And so the living word, Jesus, the creator of the universe, according to John, is the one who became part of creation in order to bring salvation uh, to us. And that's what we will be looking at in the New Testament in particular. Uh, We believe the Old Testament created the backdrop, uh, prepared the way for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. But here in the New Testament, we now actually delve into who this Jesus was and how God brought about salvation. Let's pray together and then we'll get into the lecture time for tonight. Our Father, we thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us, although you are the almighty creator, the creator of the universe, the Holy One. And you do not need us in order to exist because you exist in and of yourself. But you have chosen to create us, to reflect your image. And when we rebelled, when we sinned against you, Lord, you once again took the initiative. You came driven by your mercy and your grace and your glory to come and reveal yourself to us through Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus, that through Jesus you spoke. You spoke for the last time. You spoke 
authentically and authoritatively and finally so that we can come to know you. We thank you for this Bible, also translated so that we can read it in our own language. And as we continue to study the life of Jesus and the planting of the early church and the spread of the early church tonight, Lord, I pray that you would lead our thoughts and that you would guide us and that you would bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So welcome once again. It's uh, good to continue our study of, of the New Testament. Tonight is a, a relatively slow time because we're only going to look at two books uh, in the New Testament, the book of John and then also the book of Acts. And then next week we'll pick up the pace as we get into the life of the Apostle Paul and then uh, get into some of the epistles, the letters that he wrote, and then we will continue doing that study uh, over time. Just to remind you where we've been coming from, uh, we've been looking at the Synoptic Gospels. Um, the picture that is on the screen is a good summary of uh, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, in terms of what is unique to each one of them, but also how they um, uh, have several uh, places where they actually quote one another or they quote the same source, uh, and that is, as you see them together, um, as, as you do a synoptis, synopsis of these Gospels, uh, you see that they are very, very similar in content, in language, and in style, although each one of them has a very particular purpose. And so that's where we have been coming from. Last week we looked at a, a brief introduction to the New Testament, starting all the way back with the Old Testament history and the intertestamental history, those 400 years. And then uh, we looked at the Synoptic Gospels as they described the story of Jesus. Tonight we're going to look at John's Gospel. It's also commonly referred to as the fourth Gospel, uh, sometimes the Gospel of Love, um, but we'll briefly make a comparison between John's approach as opposed to that of the Synoptic Gospels. And uh, after that, we're going to look at the book of Acts, which is really the start or the beginning of the early Christian church. And it tells us the story going all the way up to uh, Paul in prison, which is roughly the year 64, 63, 64 AD, uh, when Paul was in prison. And then uh, as we go through the epistles, and then next week we'll look more at the life and the history of the Apostle Paul. And as we go through the epistles, we come to the end of his life uh, in the uh, pastoral epistles. Um, as they are known, that's First Timothy and Second Timothy and Titus. Uh, and those books probably, those letters were probably written after the ending of the story in the book of Acts. But more about that later on in the, ne in the next few weeks, actually, when we get to that particular point. If you are reading and uh, if you are registered for the certificate of completion, you do need to do some extra reading. Uh, your prescribed textbooks as well as uh, any other good book on the New Testament. Um, and you can look up on the internet or in a Bible dictionary uh, the Gospel of John or John the, the Apostle, uh, the Fourth Gospel, Acts Early Church, and many, many other names that may... Uh, just jump out of the page and you, I would encourage you to go and read up uh, on those uh, names or titles or issues. Last week, uh, we saw how the different Gospels each got a particular theme or a symbol um, from the book of Revelation. John is commonly associated with the eagle in the book of Revelation. And so on the picture, uh, you will see that. And if you pick up any, uh, many books on the Gospel of John, you will find that there is an eagle or some kind of an eagle symbol that is uh, associated with the Gospel of John. Uh, that has no particular significance whatsoever. Uh, it's simply a tradition that developed that the four Gospels uh, are symbolically referred to or they have picked up those symbols that are referred to uh, in the book of Revelation. And as I said, the Gospel of John is often known as the Gospel of Love. Um, and we'll talk more about that in, in just a moment. Uh, but when it comes to the writing of John's Gospel, the author is never identified, as is the case with the Synoptic Gospels. There's never mentioned that this is Matthew writing, or this is Mark writing, or in this particular case, this is John writing. Although the author does refer to himself as the beloved disciple. And um, despite that the connection is never made uh, in, in so many words in the book of John, uh, 
uh, there is a very, very strong early Christian and church tradition which is still held to by many people around the world that John is actually the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple speaks about himself in the third person, never really identifies uh, himself. And um, in chapter 21, and we're going to look at some of, of the verses uh, in, our, in the gospel tonight, um, but Jesus has, has just spoken to Peter uh, in restoring Peter um, in, in that uh, scene next to the Sea of Galilee after the, uh, the uh, resurrection. And um, Jesus uh, sp spoke to Peter about following him. Peter says, but what about him? And he refers to someone else. And then the author tells it this way. He says, Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me, Jesus speaking to Peter. Because of this, now the author is writing, because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And then verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. Now, you can argue that he wrote them down in this book. In other words, this is what I have written down, but he speaks about himself in the third person. Or it could be a reference to another book, which the author here, and then it would be an unknown person to us, who had access to and then used that information and put that in this book. Probably the first option is more logical, and that is that the author is referring to himself as the author of this particular book, but in terms of um, humility, uh, not wanting to put the focus on himself. He's just written a book about Jesus, and he has a very special approach to Jesus, as we also see in, in just a moment. And therefore, it would be, he would probably argue that it would be wrong of him to identify himself and try and focus the attention on himself. So he rather speaks about himself in the third person and never identifies himself as saying, I am John the Apostle, the beloved disciple. Um, whichever way, uh, we have no true confirmation of that except for, as I said, an early, a very strong uh, early church tradition that John the Apostle is also the beloved disciple. There are a couple of other places where this beloved disciple occurs uh, or appears in the book of John. In John chapter 13, the story of Jesus uh, coming to, uh, into the upper room and, and taking off his outer garment and uh, putting on um, a towel and washing the feet of the disciple. It was in that environment uh, where Jesus was sitting down and eating with his disciples that he said, someone will betray me. And then Peter sort of indicated to the beloved disciple to ask Jesus who it was. And again, the impression is created that this beloved disciple was very close, intimately, closely relation, uh, related to Jesus. And uh, so again, um, the, the, the author, the beloved disciple, would, or John, uh, would feel awkward to identify himself because it's, he seems to have this very special position uh, among the apostles. The, the gospel is probably the last of the four to have been written. Last week we looked at the synoptics. My argument with them is that they all were written before 70 A.D., uh, and that's the fall or the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Um, and it would be very strange that that event is not referred to, especially in the Synoptic Gospels. John has a very, very different purpose. And, and so uh, I wouldn't find it strange that he doesn't necessarily refer to that. In fact, you may actually have picked up already, as you read through the four Gospels, that John is the only one that does not describe the Lord's Supper, for example. He doesn't actually refer to the blood and the body, uh, which all three the synoptics do, as well as Paul refers that in, to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But John doesn't. John only has Jesus from chapter 13 onwards in the upper room, uh, washing the feet of the disciples, and then reclining with them, having the supper. And then there are long discourses where Jesus uh, teaches them uh, about what is going to happen, the Holy Spirit and uh, the vine in chapter 15 and the Lord's Prayer or the, um, uh, the Jesus' Prayer, intercessory prayer that we find in chapter 17 and so on. But there is no reference to the Lord's Supper or the institution of the Lord's Supper in John's Gospel. Uh, 
which is in line with John's purpose, and that is to focus the attention on the divinity of Jesus, who he was, and more specifically, the fact that he came into this world as he starts out his gospel. He is the Word of God. He is God himself who became a human being in order to save us ultimately. It is in John's gospel, or related to John's gospel rather, that we find the oldest manuscript evidence. If you have been in, in module one, you may remember something about the text of the Bible. How do we know that what the words, the actual words that we have in the Bible, that they are reliable and that they are ancient and that they literally go back to the first century as we do believe? And there's a whole study called textual criticism. Uh, I've done most of that introduction in the first module, but just by way of brief reference over here, uh, scholars have access to copies of copies of copies and hundreds and thousands of copies, uh, either in translation or in Greek, uh, and those go back all the way to mostly the fourth uh, century onwards. In other words, from the 300s uh, and onwards. So most of the manuscripts we have date from that period, and then they increase as time goes on, and by about 800, 900 or so, we, we then have evidence of hundreds and of, of thousands of different manuscripts uh, that are used in order to, if you wish, to put the New Testament to, back together uh, to make sure that the text that we have is actually a reliable text. But here we have, and, and the picture on the screen is a picture of that one uh, little bit of manuscript evidence. It's a small fragment of St. John's Gospel measuring less than nine centimeters high. And it's one of the collections of a Greek papyri. Papyrus uh, is the old, um, those days, first, second century writing materials. That, similar to paper, but it was made of Egyptian reed. Um, and um, this is, the, the plural is papyri. Uh, and, and it's held in the John Rylands Library in Manchester. On the one side, it contains parts of verses 31 to 33. And on the other side, uh, verses 37 to 38. Of, uh, chapter, of the 18th chapter of John's Gospel. So this particular fragment uh, can with almost um, firm authority be dated to about 120, 130, at least before 150 AD. So it's very early in the second century. And to date, uh, this is the oldest piece of manuscript that we have. We don't have any of the original manuscripts. In other words, the original letter that Paul wrote to the Romans or Matthew wrote the, the gospel, we don't have any of those available to us. But this one at least dates back to the first half of the second century AD. In terms of the purpose and the approach of John, he states very clearly his purpose, and we have been in chapter 21 earlier on, but at the end of chapter 20, uh, John says this, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John, in other words, tells us, that he was selective in the material that he put in this particular book, in this manuscript called the John's Gospel. And he tells us the purpose for that. I have selected certain things, he said, put it in this, in this volume, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing in him, you may have life in his name. So that is his purpose. We don't find the purpose so much stated in the other Gospels, and the Synoptic Gospels, but here we do have that. One of the differences between John and uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we saw last week, there are particular purposes, but we have to almost look beyond the surface, uh, read between the lines, like Matthew wrote probably to convince Jews that Jesus is the expected Messiah. But that you can only gather by reading through the book and reading between the lines. Here John is stating his purpose uh, very clearly for us. Many believe that John wrote later uh, than the synoptics, and we'll, we'll look at that also in a moment, but probably be, uh, the, the, the kind of approach that he's taking uh, rep represents a further development in the early church. Um, 
we must remember that the disciples, the apostles, represented a transition. They were Old Testament believers, mostly. And most of them were normal, simple, either a fisherman or a tax collector or a zealot or whatever. Uh, so they were not necessarily steeped in the theology of the Old Testament, although they knew the Old Testament, and they would certainly be, have been growing up with some knowledge of the Old Testament and Old Testament theology and beliefs. But they, they saw Jesus, they lived with Jesus, they saw Him die, and then they believed that they saw Him rise from the dead, or after He's risen from the dead, that they saw Him alive again. And, and it took a while for them to actually um, work through this information. God was working in them through the Holy Spirit. It's even told to us that Jesus opened their minds to understand the Old Testament Scriptures. But not everything was immediately clear to them. It wasn't as if any one of them would be able to sit down and write a whole book on theology uh, the way that, they, that we under, understand it perhaps today. One of the evidences for that uh, we actually find in the book of Acts. The, the concept of going to the Gentiles and including the Gentiles in the people of God was a foreign concept. They struggled over that. It took a vision from God in Acts chapter 10 for Peter even to begin to think Gentile. Up to that point in time, he didn't think about that. Although he lived with Jesus, he heard Jesus, they traveled with Jesus to a few countries around Judea at the time, but they didn't realize that initially. And so, in the Gospel of John, we, are, we probably see a development of Christian theology. In other words, who was this Jesus really? Was He just a man and did He die and, and we saved? Or who was He? And so, as time progressed, and we see that in early church, church history, actually, in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, with the Council of Nicaea and, and, and the Constantinople and, and many others like that, where the church had to gather to work their way through some of the truths that they now believe. Now, today we are the, the people who inherited all of these truths, and they are written up for us, and so on. But it wasn't easy for those early disciples. But in the Gospel of John, we see a further development of their faith, of the Christians and the apostles' faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you um, have access to scholarly books on the Gospel of John, and you may read it in some kind of a Bible dictionary or whatever, you, you will find arguments along the lines of, uh, this is not really John the Apostle who wrote this uh, Gospel. This is a, a product of what has become known as a Johannine community. Uh, and that was a community where John may have been involved at some stage, but uh, they formed the community, and out of this community came what they would call a statement of faith, and the gospel would be that statement of faith. I'm simply introducing you to that. I'm not going to go into the arguments. I personally don't hold to that. I believe John the Apostle, the beloved disciple, wrote this gospel. I have no problem uh, accepting that. I just wanted you to know uh, that there are arguments from other angles, um, but I personally don't see any convincing proof of such a Johannine community. It's a reconstruction of modern scholars uh, going back uh, you know, 2,000 years, and it's very difficult to reconstruct whatever happened, and you don't have the real information uh, about that. On the screen, the uh, picture that you see uh, is actually uh, the beginnings of the Gospel of John in the Codex Sinaiticus. Codex Sinaiticus is one of those manuscripts I refer to, one of those thousands, but this is one of the most complete ones we do have. It's written in Greek uh, in the New Testament and uh, goes back to, if I remember correctly, the 3rd or the 4th century. And is one of the most complete uh, New Testament uh, volume, uh, books that we have or, or manuscripts uh, that you have. When you look at John compared to the Synoptic Gospels, the storyline is the same. Jesus came into this world, although John doesn't describe the childhood uh, period of Jesus. Only Matthew and Luke uh, do that. Uh, Mark doesn't and John doesn't either. However, when you look at the beginnings, uh, we, we saw how Matthew went back to Abraham. Mark only starts with Jesus when he started his ministry. Luke went all the way back to Adam. John goes back to in the beginning. Now, it's interesting that he plays with words that you find in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the universe, or God created the heavens and the earth. 
and John is, is playing with that same idea in the beginning. Now, if we fast forward a little bit some weeks now from now, we'll be looking at 1 John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And it's interesting that um, we believe that it's the same author that wrote uh, those letters or those epistles as well. And you find similar kind of language. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, that we actually proclaim uh, to you, and I'm summarizing. But John goes back to the beginning. And uh, when you then begin to compare, you read through the Gospel of John, you really don't have to be a scholar to understand almost immediately that the, the ethos, the language, the approach, the description of John is very different to that of the Synoptic Gospels. The synopsis of the three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, look very similar. Uh, the language, the feel, the, uh, the grammar, and so on, the stories are very similar. But John is very different from that. He follows a different flow um, or a description of the events. When you sort of do an overlay, if you wish, uh, then John has stories and visits to Jerusalem, for example, that the others don't have. From the Synoptic Gospels, it looks like Jesus only went to Jerusalem once. But John has Jesus several times in Jerusalem, going back and forth. At one stage in chapter 4, for example, uh, Jesus goes from Judea to Galilee. He goes from Jerusalem side uh, north, and he's traveling north through Samaria, which is where he encountered the Samaritan woman. And then in the very next chapter, you may find Jesus back in Jerusalem again. And so John told us, already I read that, that he made a selection of the things that Jesus did in order to prove that Jesus is the Messiah or that he is God. John's story takes on a more theological reflection. There is no doubt uh, it, it's not just a description of history, which of course it is, but it's a particular angle to the history that John takes. And the angle is that of uh, proving that Jesus is the Word of God who was with God from the beginning and now became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, so it's far more about the identity of Jesus. And as you read through the Gospel of John and you start highlighting, and I encourage you to do that, there, there are different ways in which you can read the Bible. Uh, sometimes you want to read it for uh, maybe what it says to you about your Christian growth. Um, I, at the moment, have a, a, a habit of coloring it in. I have color pencils. And anything that is about my own Christian growth, I color it in green, for example. Or if there's a statement about my position in Christ, I may color that in blue. But when it is about God and, and who God is, or the identity of God, or in this particular case, the identity of Jesus, I may color that in, in red or in purple. Or it's something that Jesus did, I color that in purple. Um, and when you do that exercise, and you then just page through your Gospel of John, you'll see the many red marks every time there's something about the identity of Jesus. Because that's one of the things that John does, is trying to identify Jesus as the Son of God and the one who came into this world to save us. John also does not describe miracles. Um, he doesn't call them miracles. He describes ones that are different from the ones we find in the Synoptic Gospels, and he calls them signs. And uh, he particularly uses that word, uh, and, and we'll look at that also in just a moment, but he wants to highlight the fact that they are not just miracles. Jesus is not a miracle worker. Jesus performed those signs, miracles, because they point to something beyond the actual miracle that happened. And that is, it points to the identity of Jesus, the fact that he controls uh, the universe ultimately. And then John highlights Jesus' encounters with the Jews. Now, uh, it would be wrong to deduct from John. In fact, when you read through John, it looks like every single Jew was opposed to Jesus. Now, John doesn't use it in that particular way, but when he uses the word the Jews, and that's literally how he refers to them, he's referring to the leadership, either the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees or the Sadducees, uh, and they form those who represent Judaism in its pure form in the first century. And it's very clear from John's description that Jesus clashed with the Jews being 
Judaism in its formal uh, format uh, and appearance, uh, represented by their leadership. Uh, or maybe put it the other way around, that those leaders clashed with Jesus. And so John has Jesus several times in Jerusalem where he encounters the Jews. And ultimately it's those Jews who then have a trial of Jesus and hand him over to Pilate and they cause the death of Jesus. John contains no parables, interestingly enough. You go to uh, last week, we looked at some of the parables in the, and how they are used in the Synoptic Gospels. And we also listed the number of them in every one of the Synoptic Gospels. But John actually has no parables. He, Jesus doesn't tell any stories. Uh, there may be similes or uh, references, um, uh, comparisons, and so on. But it's it, in the language of John or in the description of John, uh, there are no particular parables. Also, his vocabulary is, compared to the others, rather small. It is half of that of Luke. When, and I, I'm not sure which, which of the scholars do this kind of exercise, but someone has counted the number of words in the vocab of Luke, found that there are probably about 2,000. John is only half of that. But, but the interesting thing with John is that he uses words very, very powerfully. So although his vocabulary is limited, uh, half of that of Luke, the, the meaning that he attaches to that uh, is significant. In fact, more often than not, you find John playing with words where he may use a very simple word, but there could be a double meaning. And John uses it in such a way that, that oftentimes the Jews actually misunderstand Jesus. They thought he was saying X, but he was actually really saying Y. Uh, that's the sort of thing that John does on a fairly regular basis. Why the differences? Well, I think it's the same as um, we have discovered last week with the synoptics. Um, there, are, there are different purposes. John has a very specific purpose. His work represents a more developed reflection of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and what he then came to do. So once you understand who Jesus is, you then go back and look at what he did, you will have a different understanding. It's not just a man who was born, he came and he did a, a bunch of miracles and he died on a cross. It's more than that. It goes back to the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And this is all part of God's plan. So when Jesus came into this world, born in flesh, to dwell amongst us, um, in, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it has major significance. And so John is able probably 30, 40 years later after Jesus' death, to look back and reflect on the life of Jesus in a different way than perhaps the synoptics did. And their purpose was, again, very different to that of John. He wrote to show that Jesus confronted the Jews, um, and so there may be a very strong, or there's a, a strong possibility that the readership here were also, uh, was also, uh, uh, were Jews, and that they... Um, were the ones who needed to be convicted or convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Clement of Alexandria, who lived about 200 A.D., said that John wrote a spiritual gospel. And I think that is a, a quite an apt description of the book. When you compare the synoptics, it looks like simply just a description. Jesus said this, Jesus did this, Jesus died, and so on. But John describes more. Uh, he, he goes further, he goes deeper. He uses certain opportunities to describe the life and the person of Jesus Christ. In terms of a basic outline of John's Gospel, it's best just to summarize it. Uh, if you go to some of the books that I have recommended or uh, some of the books on the Gospel, it will have a, 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 a very detailed description, breaking it down from one story to the next and one highlight to the next. But by way of a very brief summary, John gives us a prologue, which is a theological introduction to the book of John. That you do not find in the synoptics. They simply set the scene, tell the story of Jesus. But John has a prologue where he sets the scene for uh, describing who Jesus really was, the Word of God. From chapter 1, verse 19, after the prologue, we have, for about 12 chapters long, we have the public ministry of Jesus. And uh, that is Jesus traveling back and forth. He's in Galilee, he's in Judea, he's in Jerusalem, uh, he's in different places. And so he, we have his public ministry where crowds are gathering 
uh, and he, he performs certain signs or miracles. And then chapters 13 to 17 is the, something that you do not find so much in the synoptics, is Jesus' private ministry with his disciples. From chapter 13, washing the feet of the disciples, he's in the upper room. And John uses four, five long chapters to describe um, this upper room experience where Jesus is now spending intimate time with his disciples. This is the occasion where the synoptics describe the Lord's Supper. But for John, it is this, the intimacy of the moment. is Jesus spending time telling his disciples who he was, what he came to do, and then more particularly their relationship with them. And then it ends in chapter 17 with, with what has become known as the high priestly prayer, Jesus' intercessory prayer, where he prays for his disciples and he prays for all of the other disciples who will believe uh, in Jesus as a result of their ministry. Wonderful prayer, if you want to spend some time in that. And then in chapters 18, 19, and 20, uh, we have the passion and the resurrection of Jesus, also described by John in a very... Um, uh, similar fashion, but obviously unique to his own language. And then John is the one who adds a postscript. In fact, chapter 20 almost looks like an ending. Um, I've read that already where he gives his purpose. And then there's a postscript. There's a final appeal almost. And um, he says, afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon and others went fishing. And then there was a miraculous catch of fish when Jesus was standing on the shore. He invited them. And this is the occasion where he then um, talks to Peter, uh, reinstates Peter after Peter's denial of Jesus and so on. And that's where uh, the book ultimately ends, with Jesus inviting Peter to follow him. And then we looked at the beloved disciple after that. So that's a basic outline of the Gospel of John. We've referred to the signs in John's gospel, uh, all those miracles. Out of all of the miracles that Jesus performed, there are plenty of them. John selected seven, calls them signs, to demonstrate Jesus' divinity and his power over uh, the natural. The signs are often used in John's approach to introduce Jesus' teachings. Um, a very typical one is the breaking of the bread or the multiplying of the bread. Uh, which is also described in the synoptics, uh, although the synoptics have two of those. And, but John describes this multiplication of the bread. And then Jesus travels across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. People follow him. And then Jesus says to them, uh, you're looking for me not because um, you want me, but you want the bread that I have given you. But then Jesus, and in that context, Jesus then says to them, I am the bread of life. In other words, I can give you true bread. I can give you true nourishment. And so the sign is an opportunity to actually introduce the speaking of Jesus about his identity, about his character, and about who, what he came to do. For John, these signs clearly indicated that Jesus was the expected Messiah. They show his power, his might to do what only God is able to do. God controls the universe. God is the creator. Uh, God can do any miracle. The Old Testament is filled with different kind of miracles that God did from the Exodus, the parting of the sea, uh, the stopping of the Jordan River, to the fall of the walls of, Jeruz of, of Jericho, uh, to Elisha and Elijah. All those miracles are there. It's all God doing all of that. And so John sees in Jesus God coming to this world uh, in, the, in the person of Jesus and he performs miracles, it's a proof of the fact that Jesus is God. He controls uh, the, the elements, the, the natural elements, and he controls the universe. Just a listing of those signs. I mentioned the, the seven that John has, and, and here they are. The water change into wine in chapter 2. John says this is one of the first, or the first, of the signs or the miracles that Jesus performed when he changed water into wine. And Jesus reveals himself uh, as a powerful person, as, as powerful, and his disciples believed in him. And John tells us the purpose of the sign. The, after the disciples, and they have been now with Jesus for a little bit. In chapter 1, he describes how Jesus has interaction with the disciples. But here in uh, Cana in Galilee, when Jesus performs the sign, uh, 
the disciples now really believe in him. And so John is very, uh, very careful to point out that belief in Jesus, faith in Jesus, is ultimately what saves us. And then the official son is healed in chapter 4. Jesus is the one who gives life to all. There's an invalid and a long description uh, of an invalid, a man who is healed, uh, and Jesus works like the Father. There is life in the Son. That is, that's the description or the discussion that follows. Uh, that uh, the, the man is actually healed on the Sabbath. And, and, God, and Jesus says, I work like my Father. And so the Jews then want to stone Jesus because he equates himself with the Father, with God. There's the 5,000 that are fed, fed in chapter 6. And that leads to, as I said earlier on, a discussion to Jesus as the bread of life. That came from heaven. Jesus walks on water. In chapter 6, just after that story, he has the power. He has power over nature. And then there is a very long description of a blind man who was healed by Jesus. And, and it, it brings in the Jews as well. Because the man walks with his bed on the Sabbath. Uh, they challenge him. Then they say, no, you haven't been blind. Then they brought his parents in. It's a long description, ultimately. Uh, to again prove how Jesus or how the, the leaders, the Jews, were in opposition uh, with Jesus. But Jesus demonstrated that by that uh, sign, the fact that it's more than just physical blindness. It's also spiritual blindness that really needs to be healed. And the Jews proved to be spiritually blind. And this blind man, this physically blind man, actually begins to see because he begins to believe in Jesus. So spiritually, not only physically, but also spiritually, he starts seeing. And then there is, of course, the well-known raising of Lazarus from the dead, uh, and that is in chapter 11. Again, it's a long description, but it leads to a wonderful discussion of Jesus uh, who reveals his love, his power, his life-giving ability, and uh, the fact that he then refers to himself as the, the resurrection, the life and the resurrection, when he, when he talks to Mary and to Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. In terms of the message of John's gospel, he selectively used information about Jesus to confirm that Jesus is the Word of God. He is God Himself, God's final revelation. We'll pick this up again when we get to the letter of Hebrews, uh, where uh, we'll talk about God revealing Himself through Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. God speaks into this world. And again, this, the language is similar. John picks that up from Genesis 1. In the beginning, that's the word, in the beginning God created, in the beginning was the word. God spoke, God said, let there be light. The word is the spoken word now. As God spoke creation into being, so God is now speaking salvation into this world through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Son of Man. He's the Savior of mankind. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God, the incarnation of God. Uh, in fact, Jesus said, uh, you need to look at me. When, when, when Thomas, I think it was, said to him, reveal us, show us the Father. Jesus said, I've been with you for so long. Uh, and, and, and then he, he, he leads them to understand that by looking at and understanding Jesus, they have actually seen the Father. They have seen God because Jesus and the, and the Father are one. And then the titles and the claims of Jesus confirm uh, that He is God. John wrote to prove that Jesus is God. There is no doubt when you read through the book of John, from the first opening prologue all the way through, Jesus is God. Some of the characteristics that we find in John, the debates with the Jews. Um, we also have Jesus several times in contact and in conversation with individuals. They are personal conversations. Probably uh, some of the most well-known ones. There is a shorter little conversation with Philip. You don't find that elsewhere uh, in the Gospels. But then there is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is, a, is one of the Jews. He is a Pharisee. But he comes at night because he's scared of other people. And then there is this long conversation among which we find our very, very famous John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. It is in that context that, that God talks about, that Jesus rather talks to Nicodemus about the rebirth, the new birth. Unless you are born from above, unless you are born again, some translations say, unless you are born from above, you can't, uh, you can't know God. 
Uh, and of course, Nicodemus misunderstands that, which is a very typical writing technique of John. He writes in such a way that Jesus is often misunderstood. Uh, he uses irony, actually, quite often uh, to bring out the tongue-in-cheek type comments uh, that we find, such as the use of irony throughout the whole book. God loves the world. God is love. Uh, we'll pick that up again in 1 John, where John makes that statement in in so many words, God is love. Part of his character is love. And in John 3.16, we know that very well. He says that God so loved the world. And then the upper room discourse, we don't find that in the other uh, synoptics. Another characteristic of John is the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Um, th the Holy Spirit is present, especially in Luke. But, but John has longer descriptions, especially in chapter 14 and in chapter 16. Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. We would be a lot poorer in our understanding of the Spirit of God unless it was for John who, who related this uh, conversation about the Spirit and what he comes to do and how he convicts of sin and how he teaches us about Jesus uh, and so on. Jesus' high, high priestly prayer, I've referred to that uh, already. The I am statements are also fairly unique to the Gospel of John. We find the I am statements um, listed or, or referred to rather in the whole of, of John's Gospels, uh, ranging from I am the bread of life or the living bread. In chapter 6 we've referred to that already. I am the light of the world. I am from above. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life in chapter 11. And I am the way, the truth and the life in chapter 14. I am the true vine. And then probably the most direct statement of John, which really got um, uh, the backs up of the Jews at the time, uh, when you look at John chapter 8, verse 58. I'll go to um, verse 54. Jesus replied, I glorify, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim, and Jesus is speaking with the Jews. He's addressing the Jews. He's got a conversation with them. Um, he, the Father, God, he, the one you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Now, already, I mean, you've got the Jews back up here like you can't believe it. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father, Abraham, re rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Now, this is Jesus in the temple, or on the temple grounds, and he is saying the words that you don't ever say, and that is, I am who I am. That's exactly what he said. And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, it's the exact same name that God claims for himself. Moses said, uh, tell me your name, because what do I tell your people when I get there? Who are you? And God says, said, I am who I am. And so the Jews would never refer to that. Uh, and it's the word, uh, and obviously this is written in Greek, but it's the same word that you find in Hebrew <clears throat> that is related to our name for God, Yahweh, which even today Jews never pronounce for fear of taking the Lord's name in vain. No wonder they picked up stones. They wanted to stone Jesus because he was virtually saying to them, I am God. I am who I am. And uh, therefore, he got their backs up. Some of the key titles. Um, I have only gone to John chapter 1. I thought, let me just read through this one chapter. Now, if you go on and you read all 21 chapters of John, you will be able to add more, many, many more of the titles of John. But just in John chapter 1, which is significant because it's also part of that prologue that I referred to earlier on. But Jesus is called the Word, the Word of God, the Light, the One and the Only. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Um, he is the one who therefore owns the Holy Spirit in a certain sense and therefore can give the Holy Spirit. He is called the Son of God in chapter 1 verse 34 and 49. He is called rabbi and teacher. He is called the Messiah or Christ. He is the King of Israel. He is the Son of Man. Now, just in that little list there in chapter 1, you find the identity of Jesus very strongly uh, 
on the foreground and uh, on the forefront. And, and, and when you read through John, the rest of John, and I, I really encourage you to take a pen or a color, and once, every time you see something that identifies Jesus or speaks about his character or his identity, to underline it or to color it in, and you'll, you'll be surprised and blessed as you uh, do that exercise. Reading from um, the Gospel of John, uh, I encourage you to read the prologue uh, and chapter 6, Jesus, the bread of life. The Good Shepherd, again, we don't find that in any one of the synoptics, but Jesus has a long conversation uh, identifying himself as the Good Shepherd. And then the raising of Lazarus, uh, chapter 13, the washing of the feet, and then the high priestly prayer in chapter 17. And in chapter 1, 21, uh, we have Peter's commission, the reinstating of Peter, and then also the epilogue right at the end of that book. As we uh, summarize the life and the ministry of Jesus, coming to the end of the synoptics, and now tonight we've looked at John's Gospel, um, just by way of a, a brief overview, uh, the chronology of Jesus' life. Often people ask, when did Jesus go to Jerusalem? What, where, where and how did he do these things? Where did he travel? What is the chronology uh, of his life? Well, it's a very difficult question. Uh, and there have been numerous attempts in church history in the last 2,000 years to try and list everything in particular order. He was born, obviously, the Gospel of Luke, and then the Gospel of Matthew help us a little bit with that. And then he launched into public ministry. From that point on, it is not always exactly clear when did Jesus do what? Where did he travel? How many times did he go up and down from Galilee to Jerusalem or to Judea? Those things are not exactly clear. But there is an approach that is called the harmony of the Gospels. When you take all four of them, you sort of do an overlay. Uh, the, it, it is possible to do some kind of a track, a tracking of the life of Jesus. There, there are some dangers in that. Uh, the one is that uh, we actually take the gospel authors, uh, we quote them out of context. Because they have, there's no doubt that they have put the story of Jesus in a particular context. I've, I've said this to you last week when we looked at Matthew and Luke when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew collects certain sayings of Jesus and he calls it, well, he doesn't call it the Sermon on the Mount. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. But in three chapters, he describes what Jesus said on that mountain. But when you go to the Gospel of Luke, Luke has the very same sayings, but in different places uh, in the life of Jesus throughout the book of Luke. And, and here tonight, again, we saw how John made a selection of certain things in order to convey a particular message. And so the danger of simply reading it or trying to do a, a harmony of the Gospels is that we take those gospel authors out of, of context uh, and we don't necessarily read um, the story in the context and the meaning that they attach to it. And then it is possible to describe some of the highlights in the life of Jesus, and I'll do that very briefly. Uh, we obviously can look at his birth and childhood. I don't have any references here. There would be way too many to go to the actual Gospels and refer to all the passages, but you can do that exercise. Or that website that I referred to in the notes, um, feel free to go, to go there and even have a look at it. And there are books published on this harmonization uh, of the Gospels. The beginning of his public ministry, that is John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, um, the, the, the Gospels start there with the public ministry of Jesus. Then he goes into the temptation or uh, the, the desert, and then he moves to Galilee, it seems like. Um, and then there is the ministry in Galilee. There are many miracles and teachings, and he, he's on the Sea of Galilee, he's across there, he comes back, back and forth, he's in Capernaum, and, and, so, and so on. And then there's the ministry in Judea and Jerusalem. Ultimately, and this is what Luke says, Jesus put his sight on Jerusalem, to go to Jerusalem because he knew that the end uh, was in sight. There are more miracles there, some teachings, and this is where John and the, the synoptics are not uh, entirely in harmony because there are several travels uh, north and south, up and down uh, in John, uh, whereas in the, in the synoptics it seems like he focused in Galilee and then he moved to Jerusalem, and this is where he then uh, closed his ministry with the last week or weeks in Jerusalem, the arrest and the trial, the death and the resurrection, and the ascension. So that would be a fairly simple outline of the life of Jesus.
in terms of his ministry. Uh, Jesus focused his ministry on earth by teaching about the kingdom of God. This is ultimately about the kingdom of God. And, and you, won't, you will never really understand the message of the whole Bible unless you understand something about God's rule. God wants to rule the world. God created the universe to reflect His glory, and we have sinned against Him and thereby messing up God's kingdom in that way or God's image in us. And God is on, on a mission. Jesus is that mission. Jesus came to restore God's image. Jesus came to restore God's kingdom, God's rule in this world. And therefore, and as we go into the book of Acts, part of our task is to go into the world and tell them about the kingdom of God that God wants to rule in this world. And so that's what Jesus taught about. He performed miracles to demonstrate the kingdom of God. He trained apostles to continue the work of the kingdom of God. This is where we fit in. And then he fulfilled God's requirements for the atonement. Um, and, and he was the only one who could do it because he was the only sinless being who ever lived. And with that, we'll, uh, we come to the end of the gospel stories, both the synoptics as well as the gospel of John. And we're going to take a tea break and then come back and look at the book of Acts. Okay, as we get into the book of Acts, so we're looking at the story of the early church. And um, in our Bible, in the New Testament, the book of Acts follows logically, and this is where it belongs, on the story of Jesus. Jesus came, He died, He rose from the dead, He ascended to heaven, and then, of course, the church starts. But what we need to understand is, is almost the story of the Old Testament in terms of the prophets, and that is that the letters that have been written following on the book of Acts, they actually belong, many of them belong in the period of the book of the Acts. Um, and Acts would go from whenever the ascension of Jesus was, maybe somewhere between 30 or 33 AD. And um, by about 64, we have Paul in prison in Rome. And then in the meantime, Paul wrote the letters that he wrote, um, most of them, probably about 10 of them, and then maybe a three, three more of them after he was released from prison uh, in Acts chapter 28. Uh, but that's the story of the early church. In terms of the writing of the book of Acts, uh, it's commonly taken as the second of two volumes. We briefly looked at that last week. Just the way it starts resembles so much of what we find in the book of Luke. And that is in my former book, Theophilus, and uh, talking about a former book and mentioning the word Theophilus. Immediately you have the impression that you have the same author. And he says, I wrote, all, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. And then from this point on, he's going to tell the story of the church. And in that sense, it is a continuation of the same story. Jesus came, he died, he's now gone. But the story of Jesus continues because the church is really, in a certain sense, the story of Jesus continuing uh, in and, and through uh, the church or, or through the Acts of the Apostles. Um, Acts would, would have been written shortly after Luke, and if we dated Luke, let's say 62, 63 maybe, um, in that same year, or maybe months, just after mo uh, a few months, uh, Luke would have sat down and written the book of Acts as well. So not much later than 65, I believe, um, because by about 64, Paul was still in prison, and if Paul was released from prison, by the time the book of Acts was written, it would be very strange for Luke not to mention that particular fact that, that Paul was released from prison. In, in terms of purpose and design, uh, Luke tells us that he collected material. He said, I've done a, a thorough investigation. That he says in, in, the, in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. And then over here, um, he goes from collecting information all the way to personally writing, ultimately when Paul is on, on the ship to go to, uh, as a prisoner to go to Rome, then we have the so-called we passages, the first person plural, and so we believe that Luke actually experienced some of the things, he may have been a, a, one of the uh, people accompanying Paul even on some of his journeys, and at least on that final journey uh, Luke was there. But then he gives us a, a, a 
a, cue, a clue in terms of the summary of the book and how he's going to design this book. And it is, it, is the, it is a book designed around a particular purpose. And the purpose is to tell the story of the early church. And therefore, uh, Luke tells us how Jesus came to the disciples and after meeting with them for a while, uh, and when they met together in verse 6, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And then verse 8 is a key verse. And verse 8 really tells us the structure of the book. And he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then from that point on, Luke really begins to tell the story along those very same lines. We have the receiving of the Holy Spirit uh, in the description of the day of Pentecost in chapter 2. And the start of the church in Jerusalem. And from chapter 2 verse 14 all the way to chapter 8, we have a description of the church in Jerusalem. How it grew, uh, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, much later, uh, several weeks or months later, it was up to 5,000 several of the experiences of Peter, John, and so on. And then there is a persecution that broke out after the murdering uh, of Stephen. And the persecution drove them out into the country. And uh, in just a few little verses, uh, Judea is, is covered by Luke. And it tells us how they actually went into Judea. As far as they went, they proclaimed the gospel. And then there are a few key incidences in the book of Acts. The one is Samaria, where Philip ends up going to Samaria, and Samaritans just come to know the Lord, and the church is established in Samaria. And then we have the description of the conversion of the Apostle Paul in chapter 9, and in chapter 10 we have Peter with a vision from heaven going to Caesarea and preaching the gospel there to Cornelius, and Cornelius, a Gentile, comes to know the Lord. And then in chapter 11, we have a description of the first pure or primarily, maybe I should say, Gentile church in the city of Antioch in Syria. And in chapter 13, it is this particular church that now sent Saul and Barnabas into the mission field. And from that point on, the ends of the earth uh, are reached. And the book ends in chapter 28, verse 31. And I, I actually want to read this verse because it is such a key verse as you sort of uh, frame this book from chapter 1, verse 8, uh, and you go all the way to the end. That's, that gives you the introduction. And uh, in the last uh, chapter, Paul is in prison in Rome. And it says for two whole years in, in verse 30, Paul stayed there in his own rented house, and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how the book ends. And that's the closing frame of this picture. In the, in the middle, we have the spreading of the gospel. And Paul now is in Rome, which is the capital city not just of Italy. It is the capital city of the world. And it says, boldly and freely, Paul was able to proclaim the gospel. It's kind of a strange comment or a, a, a verse or language when you think about a man in prison. I mean, he's, he's, he's in, a, in a home, but he's under house arrest, if you wish. And uh, so it's kind of a strange picture to paint when you say, boldly and freely he proclaimed the gospel. But Luke is making a point. And the point is that the gospel has reached the ends of the earth, as it were. Now, that picture continues, obviously, after Acts, and it's still continuing to today, till today. And a missiologist will tell you of the unreached world out there, the 1040 window, and how many millions and billions of people have never heard the gospel, and so on. So the story continues, but the reality is that Luke tells the story in such a way that the promise that Jesus made and the command that he gave in, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, that whole thing plays out in the book of Acts. And, and this is the way roughly that one can um, uh, 
get the picture. Jesus says, you will receive the Holy Spirit when He comes upon you, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And it will, it will circle out to include uh, Judea. And then it will circle out to Samaria. And then you will reach the ends of the earth. And when you look at this particular picture, and, and uh, when we get to the final module, I will expand even, even more. But when you look at Jerusalem, those were Jews reaching Jews in a, a geographical location that was close to themselves. They, they lived in Jerusalem at the time. They were there. It's relatively easy to reach people of similar language, similar culture, similar geographic uh, um, environment. But when they went to Judea, they were reaching people of similar culture and language, but geographically they were further away. And the moment you cross over into Samaria, geographically speaking, is not that far away, but culturally speaking, they were distant. Because now you're talking Samaritans. At one stage, uh, John and James even wanted to call fire down on a town of Samaria. Uh, and when you go into the history, the uh, intertestamental history, you find Jews and Samaritans fighting one another, killing one another, uh, and certainly at loggerheads with one another. And here the gospel goes into Samaria, and people of a different culture are being reached. When you go to the ends of the earth, which is what Paul then starts doing, Antioch is now a Gentile city with a Gentile congregation. And from this Gentile congregation, now the gospel goes into Asia Minor, and, and more and more Gentiles are coming to know the Lord. Now you're talking far away, far away, geographically speaking, but also culturally speaking. The further you go from home, the, f the, f the further you are culturally and language-wise and so on. And so Jesus was really saying to his disciples, I want you to take the gospel. The Holy Spirit will enable you to do so. But to take the gospel from your home and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And the way the book is written according to uh, uh, Luke's pattern, the author's pattern here, is that that is exactly uh, what has happened over time. There is a picture on the screen with a similar sort of layout to what I have on, on the board. Some of the key events that we find in the book of Acts, we have the ascension of Jesus. This is described in more detail. In fact, the most detail that we have in all of the Bible about the ascension we find in the first chapter of Acts, where Jesus goes up uh, in a cloud and then there are angels and they say to the disciples, to the apostles, He will come back just as He left. And then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is described in chapter 2. That's another key event uh, that we need to understand. It's, a, it's an event similar to the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. Pentecost represents one of those historical, theological, biblical events that, that cannot be repeated. But as a result of that, the Holy Spirit is now here and He continues to work and He causes a stir wherever He goes and wherever He is working in the hearts and minds of people. And then in chapter 2, we have the first Christian church. We have the church in Jerusalem. And there's a wonderful description of, of how they gathered and listened to the Word of God and gathered in the temple and uh, the Lord added daily and the apostles were teaching and how they shared their, uh, their material possessions even with one another. There is chapter 9. It's another key passage where Paul is converted. And the story actually uh, turns here in chapter 9. And Luke slips this bit of information in because Paul is going, Saul at the, at the time, uh, is a very, he's going to become a very important figure. And so in chapter 9, that information is slipped in. It's only in chapter 10 that Peter visits Cornelius and the first Gentile, then proper Gentile, comes to know the Lord. Some of you may wonder about Philip and his contact with the Ethiopian. Um, so was the Ethiopian not a Gentile? Of course he was a, a Gentile, but he was a converted Gentile. He became Jew or Jewish in his belief, which is why he was in Jerusalem. He came to Jerusalem to worship, and there are many examples of that in the Old Testament era where Gentiles took on Judaism as their faith. So in the true sense of the word, the Ethiopian is not really a Gentile theologically or by faith. 
He is, uh, he's actually a Jew by faith, although uh, he, he was born a Gentile. So Cornelius is really the first Gentile to come to know the Lord, which is why the apostles and, and those who came with Peter were so surprised at the Holy Spirit being given to the Gentiles. They couldn't believe that God was doing this. Uh, so it was a bit of a, a cold water in their face type experience. Chapter 10. And then chapter 11, we have the church in Antioch. Um, you skip chapter 12 because that's another story about Peter and some, some of the miracles he did. And then in chapter 13, you have the Antioch church sending out the first missionaries. And now, interestingly enough, the weight is shifting from Jerusalem to a Gentile city, the city of Antioch. And as Paul traveled around the world in his missionary journeys, he always came back to Antioch. Antioch was his home church now. He was one of the pastors along with Barnabas, and, um, and Antioch represented the center of Christianity. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, ultimately, in the first few hundred years of Christianity, that center shifted to Constantinople in modern-day Turkey, um, which is Istanbul today. But Turkey represented the center of Christianity for many, many years. That is beyond the New Testament story. But the story shifts from Jerusalem as the center. It goes to Antioch. And when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple destroyed with that, um, burned down and destroyed by General Titus, the Roman, uh, from that point on especially, uh, Jerusalem played a minor role in terms of Christianity. Uh, and the, the, the weight shifted to Antioch and then further on, uh, to Rome and also to, to Turkey. And then in chapter 13 to 20, we have those three missionary journeys described for us um, that, that Paul, uh, that Barnabas and Saul and, and then later Paul uh, undertook. And then we have in chapters 21 all the way to 28, Paul's visit to Jerusalem where he was arrested, almost killed by the Jews. The Romans actually saved him. And he spent two years in prison in Caesarea, uh, ultimately appealing to appear before uh, the Caesar, uh, before the emperor. And he was then put on a ship, and there was a shipwreck and all the rest of it. And then in chapter 28, uh, we find Paul uh, in the city of Rome. And then chapter 28, I read a couple of those verses. That's the postscript uh, to the book of Acts. So that gives you uh, some of the key events, but it also gives you a bit of an outline of the book. We haven't covered every single thing uh, that happened in the book of Acts. Some of the key leaders that we find in the early parts of the book of Acts, we find Peter uh, in chapter 2. Uh, it is Peter who stands up and preaches the gospel uh, to the crowd on the day of Pentecost. Uh, as you go um, through the book, and I'm in Romans, so I need to go back to the book of Acts. Um, as you go through the book on the day of Pentecost, and then Peter heals a crippled beggar in chapter 3, appears before the Sanhedrin. Uh, after preaching uh, in chapter 4, they appear before the Sanhedrin. Uh, and so those chapters, and then we have Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, and the apostles heal many, all the way down to chapter 5. And then we have the choosing of the seven. Um, we also have John along with Peter. The two of them play a major role, it seems like. Uh, we, we have John, although he's sort of in the background, he's alongside Peter, even when they go to the temple and they appear before the Sanhedrin. And then we have James the Apostle. Now, there's an interesting thing over here because James the Apostle, in chapter 12, um, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And then he goes on to tell the story of the miraculous release of, of Peter from prison while the congregation, the church, is praying for Peter. This is King Herod Agrippa I, and the date is roughly 44 AD when he actually put uh, James uh, to death. And then we have an interesting shift in the picture, which is not told in detail in the Bible, and that is James, the brother of Jesus, a sibling of Jesus, takes over the role of James the Apostle. Now, that has to be the case because by chapter, in chapter 12, James the Apostle is killed. By chapter 15, there is a 
there is a meeting in Jerusalem to talk about this Gentile thing. There are Jews who say that the Gentiles must be circumcised, and we'll pick that up again and again when we go to the letters of Paul, ultimately in the next number of weeks. But Paul and several others go back to Jerusalem to have this uh, meeting. And James stands up and he says something. And then there is the, epis- the epistle of James. And then Paul mentions James as someone who is a leader in Jerusalem during this visit back to Jerusalem. And it cannot be James the apostle because he's dead. And so church tradition identified James, the brother of Jesus, as the one who took on a leadership role. We have no idea how and when this James came to know Jesus. Initially, he and some of his other brothers were actually opposed to Jesus. They, they thought he went crazy. His mother and the brothers even came to take him back home at one stage. But somewhere along the line, either around the crucifixion or the resurrection, or maybe before or slightly thereafter, James, and it seems like also a couple of other siblings of Jesus, came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And uh, we'll pick up on that as time goes on. And then, of course, from chapter 13 onwards, the Apostle Paul dominates the scene. Um, He is the one who goes on the missionary journeys uh, and travels in Asia Minor and in uh, Eastern Europe and in Greece and Macedonia and goes back and ultimately the story ends with him. Some of the other key characters that we find... Uh, there, there are the seven deacons. They are not called deacons in chapter 6. But by chapter 6, the apostles find that with the thousands of people that need care, uh, some people sold their stuff, they bring the money, food need to be bought, and then distributed to widows and people in need. They can't cope. They need to preach and, and teach and pray, spend time in the Word, and they can't cope. So they appoint seven people. Now, we call them deacons. They're not called deacons there. The word deacons or the concept of deacons, the office of deacons, we only really find again uh, in the pastoral epistles in Timothy and in Titus. But here in, in Acts chapter 6, we believe uh, um, we may find the roots, uh, the beginnings of this particular office that we ultimately call deacons. There is Stephen. Uh, I've mentioned him earlier on. Uh, he was one of the seven and immediately starts witnessing and, and preaching uh, in, in a powerful way, uh, arguing with some of the Jews, and they couldn't stand up against him. So uh, they, they take him, they, they bring some false witnesses against him, and he is ultimately martyred by stoning him to death in chapter 7. And then there is Philip. He's another one of the seven. And two interesting uh, things in his life. He went to Samaria. I've mentioned this before in chapter 8, and Samaritans come to know the Lord. And then we find uh, Philip speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch uh, on the road to Gaza. The Holy Spirit led him there, and he is the one who leads uh, this person to faith in Jesus Christ. There's an interesting story, a sort of a sequel, uh, and I say a sort of a sequel. Uh, Last year, I was able to, uh, by force, uh, to stop over in Ethiopia. We missed the flight. The Ethiopian air was late uh, on, on our way to, um, um, to Thailand. And uh, we spent a day in Ethiopia and uh, went on a tour, on a trip uh, of the city. Just, I just paid a taxi man to take us around. And uh, they have an absolute firm belief that Solomon visited Ethiopia, that he had a son with the uh, uh, with the, the queen, queen, the queen of Sheba, and that that son was the king of their country. And today, there is a very, very strong orthodox-type church in Ethiopia. Uh, and many people are, at least culturally speaking, are Christian uh, Ethiopians. And so the Christian tradition goes very deep and strong uh, in Ethiopia. And even here in South Africa and the rest of Africa, many Black churches, African churches, call themselves by some Ethiopian name. You will find the word Ethiopia in their name. And it's probably because of this kind of background, or at least some stories or legends that go around uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Then there is Barnabas. Barnabas, we we, uh, meet in chapter 4 already. He was one of those who sold some of his property, brought it to to the apostles. He soon rises in leadership. Um, in, in, the, in the circle of the apostles. And uh, when the church in Antioch uh, was established, the apostles sent Barnabas there. Barnabas is the one uh, 
who knew that Paul had come to know the Lord. And he went looking for Paul and eventually found him in Tarsus, his home city, uh, his, his hometown, and he brought him to Antioch as well. And together Barnabas and Paul served as, as pastors with a few others in the church at Antioch. And Paul, Paul and Barnabas were the ones who were sent out by the church uh, in Acts chapter 13. And then we have Timothy. And I do want to read this little bit of information uh, because we don't find much about Timothy and we find actually very little about Titus. But ultimately, when we read the, the letters to Timothy, this bit of background becomes important. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple, a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles, which is what we read about in Acts chapter 15. So that's how Timothy is introduced into the story. And then several times Paul writes letters and he says, uh, Timothy and I, or, or my fellow worker Timothy, uh, we send you greetings, or I'm going to send Timothy to you, and ultimately he left Timothy in Ephesus to pastor the church there. An interesting, interesting background here is that, that Paul decided to circumcise Timothy. And Paul is the very one who just came out of Acts chapter 15 where that was the issue. And that is Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. And here he goes in the very next chapter and he circumcises Timothy. So why did he do that? Well, one of the reasons is, um, and we will look again at that next week a little bit, but last week we looked at the dispersion of the Jews, the Jewish diaspora, uh, that these Jews were all over. And if you go into a synagogue, if you want to go into a synagogue, you have to be a circumcised Jew. Otherwise you can't go in. So it, was, it would have been a major limitation having Timothy as a co-worker and in terms of entering into a synagogue to be able to reason with the Jews there and not to be able to take Timothy with him. And so Paul thought it wise, not necessary in terms of theology or the teaching of the Bible, but wise in terms of missionary strategy to actually have Timothy circumcised. And that's why he did that for him. The world of the New Testament, um, if you look at this picture, you will see the, the darkened areas is really what represents the Roman Empire at the time, uh, completely dominating the Mediterranean at that particular time. And this was also the area, um, roughly with the Jerusalem over here, uh, where the gospel spread. This is Asia Minor, and that is um, the Eastern Europe and Macedonia over here and Greece. And ultimately, the gospel spread all the way to Italy and Rome. And uh, as far as we know, pretty soon after that, uh, the gospel re reached France and then also Spain, uh, which is in, in uh, Western Europe and so on. In the meantime, the gospel also, this, this we don't read about much, except for the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, we, read, uh, we, we know from early church history that the gospel spread and became a very, very strong force in North Africa um, and uh, for many, many years there was a very, very strong uh, Christian belief and tradition in uh, North Africa. But the world of the New Testament, uh, you can't talk about New Testament un unless you talk about the Roman Empire. We've, we've talked about this a lot in the first module, so I'm not going to expand, but the world was dominated by Rome, the Roman Empire. There was relative peace. Uh, there was an uprising in Judea, which caused the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. There were a few other uprisings related to that, such as the taking of Masada uh, in about 72, 73 AD as well. Uh, the, the next uprising is only in the second century in Judea. But, as, but apart from that, there was relative peace around the world. Um, there, were, there were no major wars being fought at the time creating a wonderful opportunity for the apostles and the missionaries to travel around the world and to spread the gospel. Uh, 
And then the Jewish dispersion or the diaspora uh, created an environment in which the Jews, the Jewish missionaries or Christians were able to go and make an immediate connection with all those hundreds and thousands of Jews that lived around the world, the known world at that particular time. The Gentile world uh, is, in a certain sense, almost another story. Uh, most people in the ancient world worshipped some form of God or idol. Uh, something such as atheism is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, Almost intrinsically, people have a belief in a God. And that's exactly what the missionaries found, wherever they went. Uh, when Paul came to Athens, he saw many altars, and he realized that these are spiritual people. And so he connected with one of those altars to an unknown God, and was able to find his way into that particular community, a non-Jewish community now, and to make a connection with them in that uh, regard. And so there was an openness to listen to something new, which uh, Paul found in Athens, for example. And evil abounded in the world. There is much evidence of unethical behavior, promiscuous lifestyles, um, atrocities committed, wars fought, uh, with, with major things going on uh, that one can't even uh, begin to relate. But Christians had a battle with that. Uh, when you go to the story of, of uh, the planting of the church in Ephesus, for example, and you pick up a little bit of that in the letter to the Ephesians, and then again in the letter that Jesus wrote to the church in Ephesus in Revelation, you see the battle that goes on with the Christians uh, really trying to get rid of unholy behavior uh, and sin in the world, which was, which was there and, and blatantly offered to them, many of them coming from that sort of background anyway. And then there was opposition. Um, that was clear. Uh, almost from day one, the Jews uh, opposed. They were the ones, ultimately, the leadership who handed Jesus over. And they were there to try and annihilate it. Paul was part of that, try and, and um, annihilate and persecute the Christians uh, if they could. But that slowly but surely was taken over by the Gentile world as well. And ultimately, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians. Um, when, when Paul was in prison in Rome. He was there because he was persecuted. And ultimately, a few years later, he was put to death, according to church tradition, by Nero, the emperor, and, and persecuted for that. Peter, in fact, the story, the, tr the traditional story about the apostles in extra-biblical literature, according to the early church tradition, is that almost every single one of the, the apostles uh, died a, a death of persecution somewhere, somewhere or the other. Uh, there was another persecution that was uh, under Domitian in, uh, in the 90s when John wrote the book of Revelation. Another major persecution against uh, the Christians. Primarily because they said that Jesus is unique and you've got to believe in Jesus, otherwise you will not be saved. And that, that, go, that goes against the grain of uh, multi, um, multiculturalism or multi uh, religion or pluralism as it's known sometimes. And even in our day and time, it's not that popular to say that Jesus is the only way. And we can in the future perhaps expect some persecution as a result or rejection at least as a result of that. When we look at Paul and his missionary journeys, um, here is a sort of a satellite uh, type picture or a Google type picture with uh, at least Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, here is Antioch in Syria. Um, the Jerusalem or, or uh, Judea is down here. Antioch is in Syria in the north on the coast. And from here, Paul left to go to Cyprus and then all the way to, uh, to modern-day Turkey and this area over there. And then coming back after his first missionary journey, he, he and uh, Barnabas. The second part of the book of Acts uh, is really about the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Luke uh, tells us about three of those journeys, uh, and uh, the third missionary journey ends with Paul on his way to Jerusalem. He, he set his sights on going to Jerusalem. He stopped in, uh, in, in Miletus near Ephesus, spoke to the elders there, but then he went down to Jerusalem. And while he was there, he was accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple area, and they, it caused a riot, and they wanted to kill Paul right there. And that's where he was captured saved by the Romans, and then ultimately after several years ending up in Rome in prison. The traveling in the New Testament uh, 
times uh, was not that difficult. The Roman roads were essential for the growth of the empire by enabling them to move armies, literally. Um, and the quicker they could move them, the, the more they had control over the world. And uh, even till today, there are remains of these roads. After 2,000 and more years, uh, the remains of the roads are still there as uh, proof of the most effective traveling system that the Romans uh, designed at that time. Um, and just on, on that particular quote from Wikipedia, at one stage, at its peak, the Roman road system spanned 53,000 miles and contained 372 uh, links as well. I am going to refer to the life of the Apostle Paul, and I'm, I'm going to do that next week. I'm going to go into the life of the Apostle Paul. But I, I'm putting up a summary of the dates, just to put the book of Acts in perspective. And as time goes on, we'll put the letters on a timeline as well, almost like we did with the prophets in the Old Testament, but to get a, a full picture of when Paul probably wrote all these different letters. Uh, it's therefore important to understand something about Paul and his background. Uh, Paul became a Christian. We'll look at that next week and how he became a Christian and when, uh, or what, what we think may be the, be the date. But by about 35, he visited Jerusalem for the first time as a Christian. Now, he studied in Jerusalem, so it wasn't an unknown place for him. But to go back as a Christian, and he had difficulty being accepted by the Christians there, the apostles, they were afraid of him. It was Barnabas who introduced him to the apostles and said, this man really became a Christian and a follower of Jesus. By about 47, and you'll see immediately that there is a 12-year gap. Um, some say somewhere between 14 and, and uh, 12 and 14 years. There is a gap that we actually can't uh, identify in the life of Paul after he became a Christian it was by 47 that he became that he went on his first missionary journey by 49 uh, we're in Acts chapter 15 and the Jerusalem council and then 49 to 52 the second missionary journey and then we have Paul and this is a key date and we'll look at that next week Paul is in Corinth the city of Corinth in 52 50, uh, 51 52 the year 51 52 and then 52 to 57, a longer missionary journey, the third one. That ends in uh, Jerusalem in 57, and somewhere between 57 and 64, Paul is on trial, and he goes to Rome, and he ends up in prison. And then there are possibly further travels, which we cannot prove necessarily, not from the Bible at least, and his execution that may have taken place about 66 A.D., so hold on to those dates because they will become very important. I have another slide over here with uh, missionary journeys, uh, and they are in color, the three missionary journeys, uh, all starting uh, in Antioch, uh, the first one just around that circle roughly, and then the second one even further, and the third one even further, and then it ends with the green line, which is the route uh, to Rome uh, in Italy with a shipwreck and so forth as well. Some of the themes that we find in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is God's presence and the sign of a new era. The new era has dawned. Uh, this is a new age, a new era, and we're living in the era of the Holy Spirit and the church. The book contains the book of Acts, the Acts of God, uh, although it, it picked up the title for some reason as the Acts of the Apostles, it rather is the Acts of God. God's plan and purposes are revealed. Uh, again, as they, as they pan out, if it was only for the Gospels, we may still be stuck with a bunch of Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah only for the Jews. Uh, but the book of Acts actually tells us the story of the spread of the Gospel around the world. And then nothing can stop the Gospel. Um, and that is one of the encouragements that we have, is that nothing can stop the spreading of the Gospel. Uh, the Jewish-Gentile relationship thing is critical in the book of Acts. We'll pick that up again in the letters. Again and again it has to be addressed, but it is very clearly described as a transition here in the book of Acts. And then the emphasis shifted from the capital of the Jews, Jerusalem, ultimately the, to the capital of the world, which is Rome, indicating God's plan for the world. If you read, uh, to pick up the story of Acts, then I suggest the Ascension of Jesus, chapter 2, the Pentecost, the first Christian church, Paul's conversion, uh, Peter's visit in chapter 10 to Cornelius, in chapter 11 and 13, which is uh, 
really the shift of emphasis in the book, and that is shifting from Jerusalem to Antioch, and then the postscript that you need to read in chapter 28. If you want to do further study, uh, this brings us to the end of the historical phase described in the New Testament for us. We'll pick up bits and pieces here and there um, beyond the book of Acts, but they are, they are by way of a letter written. Uh, it doesn't give us any historical information. It's mostly teaching. And then also the book of Revelation, which is really an apocalyptic book, and it doesn't provide as much by way of history. Uh, but in terms of the historical description, or the description of the history of the early church, this is the end. You want to know more, you need to then go to church history books, and they are plenty everywhere. Um, I have several on my shelves, and uh, if you want to read up that, that, there are volumes and volumes and volumes written about church history, starting with uh, the early church and then into the second century with the early church fathers, uh, and, and then from that point onwards. Some of the story of the New Testament will be completed as we continue our study with the letters. Uh, and I do encourage you to read up on uh, church history. It provides us with wonderful information about where we are today and uh, the rich uh, history and tradition uh, that we have, the legacy that has been left for us. Now next week we'll look at Paul, we'll look at letter writing, and we're going to study uh, Rome, Romans, the book of Romans, as well as First and Second Corinthians. Next week is going to be a, a real mouthful, and so um, I'll, I'll talk like a machine gun, but I just want to warn you up front that it's going to take quite a bit uh, to get through the material for next week. So thanks for coming, and may the Lord bless you, and I'll see you next week.